Okay, hello. Uh, thanks for showing up. Welcome to audio in standard C++. Um, this is what we're going to talk about today in the next 90 minutes. So we're going to look at uh, you know, whether there actually is any audio in C++ today and what you can do with it. And then uh, the next section, actually, can I ask who here is actually a professional audio kind of developer or has done audio stuff before? Okay, three people. So, okay, so for you, the first half an hour will be quite boring. This is like the basics, you know, all this. For the rest, uh, this is where we're going to explain how audio actually works, like on a very low level, so that we all know kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, so, we're going to talk about sound waves, about uh, how do you represent an audio signal digitally in a computer, how audio I.O. works, how do you communicate with your sound card, and then a little bit about kind of how you build on that um, <coughs> for some functionality. And then kind of the meat of the talk is the um, kind of second half here, which is um, the um, proposal for actually um, an audio API for the C++ standard library. So we're going to look at the API design, what classes are in there, what interfaces are there. We're going to look at, um, I'm going to give you an update on the latest state of this proposal, which is R2, which is still in progress. And then uh, we're going to look at the reference implementation, and we're going to do a live demo. So I'm going to show you some actual running code, because we have implemented this. Uh, this is where it usually all goes wrong, if you do live demos during <laughs> talks. So, you know, don't expect stuff to work. Um, and then kind of a few more slides about, like, what's next. And um, yeah. So um, let's start. So audience here with us today. Uh, all notebooks, all desktops, all phones, all the phones that you have in your pocket, all the stuff that you have on, on your table have audio input and audio output. A lot of embedded audio devices also have audio, at least audio output. Even if you have like a microwave, it's probably going to give you a sound at some point. So I would say that most or a lot of devices that run C++ actually are capable of audio I.O. and it's part of their functionality. Um, and actually, audio is really, really important for a lot of areas where C++ is used. So obviously, if you have any kind of user interface, you know, with some buttons or whatever, dialogues, then you want to have some sound to reinforce, uh, you know, your interaction with that user interface. Um, obviously, if you have software to make calls or to communicate in other ways, typically you will have audio in there as well. Uh, obviously, if you're actually playing back sound, if the whole point is like streaming and song from the internet or just playing back a file, then this is also audio. Um, games are unthinkable about sound. Imagine how boring a video game would be if you wouldn't have any sound. Um, and then um, there is this pro audio domain, which is kind of what I do, which is music software and software for music production and software for music performance. So basically software for musicians and producers and performers. Um, and then there's other areas like creative coding, if you have installations or if you have art. A lot of time there's some code running there which, and there's also audio in there. Audio is used for research, for science, and also audio is great for education. You know, when you know, kids learn how to program, it's really cool if they can make sound with their program. That's, that's pretty good. Again, you can't even code like a simple video game without it. So what I would say is that audio is one of the basic aspects of human-computer interaction. Right? So imagine, like, you know, one of the simplest uh, um, games, for example, uh, something like this, uh, which has been around for a lot longer than I am alive. Um, so imagine, what do you need to implement this? You need um, a screen that you can draw into, so you need 2D graphics. You need some kind of user input, like keyboard, mouse, or joystick, or buttons, or something like that, and you need sound. Right? So yeah. you need some kind of feedback that if the ball bounces back and forth, you're going to get some, some sound effect that tells you what's going on. So you always need these three things in order to even do the very, very simplest things. So um, what I would like to, I would like to live in a world where we can do this in standard C++, where you can take a compiler out of the box, and you can build something like this with it. Where are we today? So. <coughs> Question to the room. Can you write a C++ program today just using standard C++ that makes sound? 
Um, doesn't matter. Like, can you make a portable? Yes. Where well, you have the bell character. Yes, you have the bell character. <laughs> <laughs> so you can try this. If you, I mean, I tried it on my MacBook uh, an hour ago. It actually does make beep, right? So, and probably on Linux on Windows it's going to do the same. So we can actually make sound in C++ today without any <laughs> third-party stuff. <laughs> okay, let's let's go back to this. Is this enough to to do this? It turns out not quite. So in order to do even this, you already need two different sounds, right? So you need one sound if you successfully, if, the, if you hit the ball successfully, and you need a different sound if the ball you know, goes off the edge and, and you lose. So you need two different sounds for that. So you can't even do this in standard C++. <coughs> I think we can do a bit better. And actually, we are doing a bit better, because obviously, audio is widely used in C++ today. So and how do we do that? So first of all, all these operating systems, they give you native audio APIs, right? So in Windows, you have a bunch of them. You have Wasapi, you have ASIO, you have uh, direct sound. Some of them are deprecated. On, on Apple operating systems, you have core audio, which is their um, sound framework. On Linux, again, you have um, a bunch of options, with ALSA probably being kind of the lowest level and most widely available one. And then on Android, you ha again have a bunch of APIs uh, that you can use. Um, and then if you want to do cross-platform stuff, which is obviously what you want to do if you want to use C++, or a lot of us want, then there's a bunch of cross-platform middleware. And then that, this is what you will need to use if you want to um, do sound across different operating systems. And depending on um, you know, your industry and what kind of a, uh, application you're developing, you're going to use different things. So there's some general purpose things like SDL, port audio. Um, if you're into games, you're probably going to use something like FMOD or WISE. Uh, if you're in pro audio, which is kind of my domain, uh, the most popular one is Juice. Um, a lot of companies don't use Juice. They have their own in-house uh, frameworks that basically do these things. Um, interesting is that many of these APIs, both the native and the, the kind of middleware ones, are actually not C++, but they're C. Or if they're C++, they're kind of more like C++ 98 kind of stuff. Or some of them on Android are even Java APIs. And the other really interesting thing about all of these APIs is that at the low level, what happens uh, kind of inside is always the same. Like, how do you represent audio and how do you get audio in and out of your sound card? It's pretty much the same everywhere. And the way this works hasn't really changed since several decades. So, Ever since the computers became fast enough to do audio in real time, somewhere in the 90s, this hasn't really changed. Um, so, you know, there's more like different high-level things, but at the low level, what, what's going on is always the same. And it feels like C++ uh, is the perfect language to, to do this. Right? So here's a quote from, from Bjarne. Uh, C++ is there to deal with hardware at a low level and to abstract away from it with zero overhead. And it's surprising to me that for audio, you don't quite have this. Because for me, it's like, this is a, it's a great use case for this. So we have, obviously, all these audio libraries, but we don't have anything uh, in the C++ standard. So um, what do we mean if you say low level? So let's briefly talk about what's kind of the lowest, the lowest level if you talk about uh, audio on a computer. So obviously, what is audio? Um, let's start with sound waves. Uh, if you have something vibrating, like this tuning fork here, then this is going to push the air, and then what basically sound is, is like traveling waves of variations in air pressure, right? And then um, when we hear this, we have this ear, and then what happens basically is that these waves that consist of variations of air pressure is going to hit our eardrum, the eardrum is going to vibrate, and then that's going to uh, excite all these different bones, and then the signal is going to go into the cochlea, and then it's going to be picked up by these nerves, and eventually it's going to arrive in our brain. So this uh, idea with the waves and kind of the membrane, if you go to the um, kind of computer world, um, a microphone pretty much works the same way. You know, we have sound waves, and then the microphone, there is a membrane diaphragm inside, which vibrates pretty much like our eardrum. The, the difference here only is that it's not translating it into kind of mechanical uh, waves that then go into the brain, but it's instead there is a coil and it's inducing uh, a current and then it's translating that into an electrical signal. 
which then goes into our sound card. And then the other way around, if we have output, it's pretty much the same thing, just the other way around. So we have a computer which uh, you know, emits some electrical signal, which is then converted into an analog, elec an analog electrical signal. And then it just goes the other way around. There's like this coil uh, and the magnet, and then that um, excites uh, a membrane, which then vibrates. And that, again, pushes the air, and that reproduces the sound. So this is always the principle what's going on. So um, we have an audio signal, and we have ways of getting it in and getting it out. How do we represent now audio data in a computer? Because this is all the analog world, right? It's like things vibrating. This is like physics. Um, but we're talking about computers. So um, if you talk about these vibrating things, then uh, basically what an audio signal is, it's um, basically the amplitude of that vibration over time. So this is what an audio signal is. It's, it's just a quantity over time, which is the amplitude. And you can represent it in whatever way, current. Um, and in a computer, obviously, you want to represent it digitally, so you want to represent it with bits and bytes. And the way to do this is by sampling. So this is, I think, not very surprising to anyone. If you have a continuous signal which varies some kind of quantity, then you're going to sample it. And each sample is just going to be a number, something like a floating point number, for example. Um, so that is just a single numerical value which represents the um, amplitude of the sound signal at this point in time. Um, and this principle of doing this is called uh, linear pulse code modulation. And uh, this has been around for almost 100 years now. So uh, if, you, if you look up Wikipedia, so there's a reference in 1926 to someone who uh, basically invented PCM and was using it. And this person was using 5-bit PCM. So they were using 5 bits to represent um, one sample. So really, the only thing that changed over the last 100 years is that we have more bits now. This is literally the only thing that changed. This principle of representing sound digitally in this way has been around for a very, very long time. Um, so there are other ways of representing sound, uh, which are sometimes used in kind of specific applications. But um, in the vast majority of use cases, this is the way to do it. Um, so. This, we can call this the standard for representing audio. Uh, there's two quantities here which are interesting, which is the sample rate, which is how many samples you have uh, per second. And the other one is the uh, bit depth, which is how many bits you have to represent a single sample. And those are interesting because they, are, they basically reflect uh, kind of human hearing. Right? So the sample rate is going to decide what frequencies you can represent. So there is this Nyquist theorem, which says that if you have, like, for example, 44100 hertz, which is a sample rate of a CD, then the highest frequency you can represent with that is half of that. So you can go up to 22,050 uh, hertz. Um, and uh, this is pretty much around the, the limit of, so the, the limit of human hearing goes up to about 20,000 hertz. And then it kind of decreases, decreases as you age. Yeah, yeah. So it depends on the person, depends on your age. But if you, are, if you use something like 48,000 hertz, so you can go up to 24,000 um, hertz in terms of frequencies you can encode. It's safe to say that this way of doing it can represent all frequencies that humans can hear. And the bit depth is also similar. So the bit depth basically says what dynamic range you can represent. So if you have a bit depth of 16 bit, which is the bit depth of a CD, you can represent about 96 uh, decibels. Uh, if you go up to 24 bit, which is kind of used in a professional um, settings, then um, can represent uh, 144 hertz, I think. Uh, sorry, de deci 140 decibels. And this is around the dynamic range of the human hearing. So if you look at the faintest sound that human ear can hear, and then on the other end of the spectrum, like the loudest kind of pain threshold before the eardrum bursts, then the, the dynamic range between those two is about 140 decibels. So basically, with these two kind of quantities, you can, you can cover everything that humans perceive as sound. Of course, because you're quantizing in both of these dimensions, this means we get artifacts. And there's this nice analogy to graphics, where basically uh, graphics is basically the same just in 2D instead of 1D, right? Um, so so it's, you're kind of sampling things. And then uh, the sampling rate is pretty much the uh, kind of resolution. 
and the bit depth is like the how many bits per color per you have to represent the color. So here, if you if you have a lower resolution, you can represent fewer details. That's kind of this axis, and on this axis, if you have fewer bits for each color, then you're going to lose um, you're going to lose kind of the different shades of the of the colors. And you you, ha you have the same kind of artifacts um, in sound as well, except that they manifest themselves as um, audible noise or artifacts. Right, so we have this. This is how you represent an audio signal. Uh, one thing that's missing is audio can be multi-channel, right? So micro this microphone has like one channel. If you have headphones, typically it's stereo. If you have surround, you can have six channels, so you can have even more. So we need to uh, add to this picture the notion of a channel. So um, then we not only have um, kind of samples over time, but we also have channels. Um, and then um, the other term, which is really important here, is the frame. And that represents basically the value of each channel at a certain point in time. So the, the terminology here is, is really important. Some people kind of say sample when they actually mean frame, right? Sample is one number and a frame is one number per channel. So it's really, really important to uh, not confuse these two terms. All right, so we have channels, we have frames, we have samples. We pretty much have everything in place. Uh, one thing to say about channels, channels can have names. So it's not just channel 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, it's like left, right, surround. There's different channel layouts. So if you have six channels, you don't know if it's three stereo, if it's five one. So you know they have there's there's more to it than just kind of having n channels. And unfortunately, on on computers, this is not portable. So I think on on Mac it's like left, right, center, and on Windows it's left, center, right, or the other way around. I can never remember it. But basically, the meaning of the channels is kind of independent of of the index, so to say. So this is like another thing to keep in mind. Right, so now we have this uh, audio data. How do we um, get it in, get it out of something like a computer? For that, we have audio devices. There's two kinds. Um, there's actually three kinds. There's input devices like a microphone. There's output devices like speakers. And then there's devices that do both, input and output. And then some of them have one channel or two channels. And then if you are kind of a professional sound engineer, you might have one of those, which has maybe 16 ins and 16 outs. Um, so there's all kinds of devices, um, <coughs> built in, external, but they all do the same. Basically, uh, they have a number of input channels and or a number of output channels. Um, one thing about devices, um, so we said we have a sample, which is a numeric, uh, basically, value. Um, what type is this value? And that also depends on the device. So. Um, so this should say desktop software, not desktop hardware, sorry. So on desktop software, you typically represent a sample with a, with a floating point number, which is conventionally between minus one and one. Some phones, um, especially older ones, um, they use 16-bit integer. Other machines may, may use 8-bit integer or fixed point. So you can have different, uh, um, a different numeric um, type to represent the sample. And um, all these things, actually can also change, change at runtime. So this is just a screenshot of my, my notebook's uh, audio settings. And you can see that you have all these different devices. Some of them are input, some of them are output. Then I have this uh, weird in and out kind of aggregate device. And then each one of those devices, you can choose uh, the sample uh, rate, like this 48 kilohertz or whatever. You can choose how many sam uh, channels you want, and you can choose um, the type, um, the numeric type, how to represent sample. So all these things, you can, they can change at runtime, right? This is, this is important because it's not just like a type def somewhere. They can change at runtime. Um, so if you have a notebook, typically if you have, you can have multiple devices. Like right now, for example, I have a microphone, speakers, HDMI connected, and headphone out. Typically, if you have something like macOS, Windows, Linux, then one of these uh, devices will typically be the default input, and one of them will be the default output, and you can typically choose which one uh, you want to use. Or um, an app might just use the default, or an app, if you have a more advanced uh, audio app, then you might, the user might be able to choose which device they're going to use. Like, for example, if you have something like, I don't know, Skype, then you can go into the preferences and choose a device which is not necessarily the one that's configured um, in, the, in the operating system settings. Um, 
and then um, the device configuration changes runtime, right? So you can I can yank out this cable, and then this device is going to disappear, and then you know an app needs to handle that in a reasonable way. Um, and for example, here is, this is like Discord. So if you plug something in, some devices will detect that something happened and will suggest to you, well, do you want to switch the device? Others will just use the default. Yet others, I mean, there's different ways you can handle this, but the important thing is that there are all these different devices, and they change. Um, you might have more stuff. So um, the operating system might have uh, kind of a mixer or other effects going on. Um, you have typically like a global kind of volume setting. And then uh, this is kind of a more advanced feature. Um, some kind of driver APIs allow you to use uh, exclusive mode which means that if you have an app, it's going to be the only app that's talking to the sound card. And then you're going to be directly uh, uh, writing out basically the, the signal that goes out, out to the speakers. The normal case is the shared mode where you have different apps running and each one makes different sounds and then the operating system is going to mix them all together and that's what <coughs> you're going to get as the output. And then if you have um, like mobile devices like phones, there's more stuff going on. So you have these audio sessions like on iOS and on Android. You have these APIs where um, I don't know, like, let's say you have a music player going on and then someone calls you and then that has like higher priority. So this call will interrupt your app. And then if you hang up, then, you know, the app focus might go back to your app or whatever. So, and then there's, there's this other thing where, you know, for example, if you want to record stuff, there might be some security feature saying, um, hey, do you want to allow this app to access the microphone? So there's a lot going on here. Um, and from like an architectural point of view, what, what, what happens is that there's all these different layers. So at the very bottom, you have a, some kind of hardware device, which actually has an audio, uh, sorry, analog digital converter. Um, then there's like a driver for this device. Then this driver talks to the kernel of the, of the operating system. The operating system is doing some stuff. It's grabbing some data from the hardware, writing it into some memory somewhere, or like reading it from there. Uh, and then the operating system gives the user an API. And then the user is going to talk to that API. And there's different ways of doing that. You might use one of those cross-platform middleware frameworks, uh, which kind of just abstraction layer on top of the different APIs on different platforms. You might have like a higher level framework like FMOD, which gives you kind of more high level tools. Or you might just have an application that directly talks to uh, you know, the Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, whatever API. Um, so there's all these different layers and different ways of doing it. Um, but then um, at the end of the day, you have audio data. You have these um, samples and frames and channels, and they go all the way from the bottom, all the way to the top, through all these layers and back. And how does that happen? So um, if you have a sound card, each sound card has one of these, which is a little quartz crystal, which is a timer. And then it also has somewhere, you know, some buffer with memory where the data goes. And then what happens is that uh, thanks to this timer, you're going to get a callback through all of these layers. And this callback comes in regular intervals. So, um, and, and the other thing here is that um, the audio is done in, in buffers. So um, we need to add one more thing, which is kind of the last term that we need here to this picture. So now we not only have samples and frames and channels, but we also have a buffer, which is basically a chunk of, of this stream. Um, and um, basically, this is a 2D array of numbers, right? So you have channels and you have uh, frames. And basically, what a buffer is, it's a chunk of 2D. It's a 2D array of, of some numeric type. That's what it is. And the reason it's done in buffers is, well, so you get this audio callback, and it would be very inefficient. Remember, the, the sampling rate is something like 48,000 frames per second. So it would be very inefficient if you get 48,000 callbacks per second through all these layers. That would not be possible. Um, so what you get is you get fewer callbacks, and each callback is giving you a chunk. Now, here's a trade-off here, because if, if um, basically if you use bigger buffers, then um, you have like less, um, it's less expensive to you have less calls, so you're going to consume less CPU, but you're going to introduce more latency, right, because you're buffering. So the bigger the buffer is, the more latency you're going to have. And if you're just playing back a file, like a, a music file maybe, it doesn't matter. But if you're, if you're performing music, for example, you're playing a keyboard and you, want, you expect your notebook to uh, play what you're playing, um, then latency is really annoying. Like 
the latency of like 30 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds is something that you're going to notice uh, if, you, um, if you play your keyboard. So it's really important to keep this latency down. Um, so <coughs> typical values for these buffers are something like 128 samples, 256 samples, or 64 samples if you really want to have like low latency. And that means you're going to get a callback every one or two milliseconds, something around that. This is kind of the, uh, the, the time frame we're talking about. Um, and um, this is actually typically if you have like a more kind of professional audio application, this is a uh, screenshot of Ableton Live, then you can set this buffer size and then you can choose this trade-off between kind of CPU load and latency. Um, so one more thing uh, about these buffers. So we said it's a 2D array. 2D arrays have two ways you can order them, right? There's row major order and column major order, like which dimension around. The same with audio, except that we call them differently. So we have Let's say we have two channels, left and right, so there's these two different ways of doing it. You can have an interleaf <coughs> buffer, which basically means it's frames first. So you're going to have channel 0, channel 1, and that's your first frame. And then channel 2, channel 3, this is the second frame. Or you can do it the other way around, where you have, like this would be a buffer with four frames, and then you have all the, f all the samples for the first channel and then all the samples for the second channel. So these are the two different ways of doing it. And then um, this callback that you're getting from the sound card, you're going to get to read this buffer if it's input, or you're going to write into the buffer if it's, if it's output. And this looks something like this. So this is uh, how you would write callback in one of those uh, middleware frameworks. So you get this callback, which is just a function. You get like a pointer to a pointer to like the input buffer and a pointer to a pointer to the output buffer. So this is like a 2D, 2D array, remember? And then it's going to tell you how many channels you have and how many frames you have. And then you can fill that buffer. Um, so here, um, for example, you would... Um, this is like a very simple uh, algorithm where you just write like a sine wave, which is just like beep, like a very boring kind of tone with a uh, stable frequency. So you're doing kind of a sine wave. So you're just generating, you're looping over the frames and over the channels, and you're just writing numbers uh, into, this, into this array. And this is how, like at the low level, how it's often done. Um, so this is kind of, uh, I mean, in 2019, kind of looks maybe a bit ugly. So there's like a row pointers to pointers. There's a lot of parameters. This is basically C code, right? So a lot of audio code is written this way, where it's kind of C++, but the actual code is like C compiled with a C++ compiler, or maybe a few C++ features. But a lot of people write code this way. Um, so which is why I think, you know, it's important to um, maybe think about whether we can give people a more, more modern APIs to do this kind of stuff. Um, and one more important thing about this audio callback. So you're going to get this callback through all these layers of APIs every, I don't know, one, two milliseconds. Um, the important thing is that this is a high priority operation because what happens if you miss one of these buffers? Like you get a callback and you have like one millisecond to write a buffer and you don't do that. Like for example, you, there's an error or something takes too long and then you miss one of those callbacks and you get the next one before you've written the buffer. That's going to be sent, it's all real-time stuff, right? So it's going to be sent to the speaker. So you're going to have garbage values or maybe no values being sent to the speakers, being converted to actual sound, and you're going to get them, um, you're going to hear them. So that's going to be a dropout or a click or some other artifact. And it turns out that the human ear is really, really sensitive to um, kind of inconsistencies, um, incontinuities, is that the English word? Incontinuities in the, in the audio signal. Discontinuities, yeah, thank you. Um, so if, for example, you're writing these buffers and you miss a single sample, you're going to hear that as a click. So it's really, really important that if you're in this, in this callback where you're writing stuff into this buffer, you're never going to miss a sample. You cannot fail. Uh, because then, you know, if you have uh, some kind of uh, music app going on and then it, 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 it has uh, clicks and glitches, no one's going to use it. So, so this audio callback stuff is typically what we call near real time. It's not like... It, uh, so it's not exactly the definition of a real-time system, like an airplane or something, because you still have an operating system going on. You still have like a thread skewed scheduler, but typically the stuff will run on a high priority thread. And you only have something like one or two milliseconds to, to produce your data and you cannot fail. Which means, you said you cannot fail, you said that, um, you have to program in a very specific way inside this callback. You can't use logs or mutexes. Yes. Where are the volatiles? Like in the example of code, are we 
don't we need some volatile to make sure the compiler doesn't optimize stuff too much? So the question was, why is the why do we not write to volatile uh, data? And um, well, the answer is that it's not directly um, the hardware. It's not like directly the the memory of the sound card directly mapped into your memory. There is there is a layer in between where typically in the kernel uh, space of the operating system, there's going to be some extra buffering going on. So typically, you have like the actual hardware sound card buffer, and then the operating system will kind of copy things out into another buffer, and there's some stuff going on under the hood so that the, um, the buffer that you get as a user is not the actual volatile hardware buffer. On an embedded system, that would be different. On an embedded system, this would probably be volatile. But the code I showed is kind of stuff that would run on a, on a desktop. Yeah? OK, cool. So we are in this near real-time world, which means um, the tablet just gone out, so I don't know what time it is. Oh, I know. OK, my laptop shows me what time it is. Good. Um, so we can't use mutexes, we can't use locks, because if you're waiting for another thread, first of all, we don't know how long it's going to take. Second of all, the thread we're waiting for might have a lower priority, so you get this priority inversion thing, where the high priority thread is waiting for a low priority thread, and then the high priority thread will actually kind of be effectively low priority, and then this whole thing could be scheduled out by the scheduler, and then it could schedule something else instead, and then you're going to get an audio dropout. That's not good. So you can't use locks. You can't allocate memory, because that's the same thing. You don't know how long it's going to take. You obviously can't do any file or network input output or even see out or anything like that on the audio thread, because that's we don't know how long it's going to take. It's typically going to be a non-deterministically timed blocking operation. You basically can't call any code where you don't know how long it's going to take. So you can't call into any. Uh, Third-party API typically, unless you know it says this is safe to call in this real-time context. Um, so, what you're going to be doing here, because obviously, if you have this processing thread going on, you need to get data in and out of your uh, of your processing, right? So, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to have to do block-free programming. You're going to use atomics. You're going to use lock-free queues, lock-free structures. Um, those are essential tools um, if you do low-level audio coding. So, this is kind of the world. Um, that all you developers live in, which is why um, you know C++ is good because it gives us these tools. C++ is not uh, itself explicitly like a real-time safe language. Like you can't say in C++, okay, this function you know is declared to not <coughs> take longer than a millisecond. You can't do that in C++. But C++ gives you tools so you can ensure these things via the way you write code, because you know we don't have a garbage collector. We do have atomics and all these things, etc. Okay, so um, but. You know, this is kind of the low level, but a lot of people who are not kind of professional audio developers, when they see this, they say, oh, this is all, I don't really care about this stuff. You know, this is all, this happens under the hood. I don't care about this. You know, what I want, I want to be able to do this. You know, this is what, like, most of the time, if I talk about the stuff to, like, non-audio people, this is what they say. I don't care. I just want this. Give me this, and then I'm going to be happy. Well, so how do, we, how do we do this? How do we actually play back a file? So now we talked about how, how, kind of how it works. So now think about it. It, it, you know, it. it looks like it should be the simplest thing. But what do we need to make this happen? OK, so first of all, we have this audio processing thread. We talked about this, right? So we have this uh, actual sound card, which is an actual kind of timer going on. And you get this real-time callback. Then you get like a buffer. You generate some samples. Uh, you probably need to resample them, for example, if you um, play back a file and then the file is you know, recorded in one sample rate and your uh, machine is configured to another sample rate, you need to resample it. So even just to play back a file, there's going to be some uh, number crunching going on. Then you need to keep it between minus one and one because then you get, otherwise you get glitches again or you get distortions. So you need to kind of clip it. So you have all this number crunching going on. And in the end, you have to write the result into this buffer. And then, um, so this is how you kind of push the data out to the speakers. And then the data comes from a file because we are, we are playing back a file. So what you need to do is you need to read the actual file, the actual WAV file or MP3 or whatever you have. You need to decode because it's not raw samples. It's not the format we discussed. Like it's some kind of compressed format or at least kind of packaged up in, a, in some way. So you need to actually decode it, do a lot more number crunching if it's a compressed format. 
And you can't do that on the audio processing thread, right? Because this is file I.O. This is like non-deterministic. It's not real-time safe. So the question is, how do, we, how do we connect these two, right, to just um, even play back a simple file? And the answer is, well, you need to buffer it. You need to have a log-free buffer, right? So you're going to read the file on one thread, decode the wave or MP3 or whatever, and then you get these frames and buffers. You push them to this. So this buffer, this is not the audio buffer. It's like um, the word buffer here I use in terms of what I mean is a log-free log -free FIFO, right? So you push some samples onto this FIFO, and then on the other, on the processing thread, you, 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 pull, you pop them. So this way, it's, it's log free. And this is, you have to do all the stuff in order to just play back a file. Now, the interesting bit is, you can do almost all of the stuff portably in standard C++ today, right? So to decode a WAV file, maybe you want to use some library, but at the end, you're just reading from a file and you're doing some numeric operations. Log free queue, we can write that in C++. It's, there's one in Boost, you know, there's uh, all, the, all the rest, we can do that. The only bit that we cannot do portably in C++ today is this. We cannot read and write from and to an audio device without using um, basically third party uh, libraries that talk to uh, proprietary native non platform, uh, basically platform specific APIs. So this is the one bit that is not portably doable in C++ today, unless you use proprietary software, um, which, which is going to be outside of the scope of the standard because um, you know, you're talking to some operating system specific API. So I think this is unfortunate because you know, we got file system now in the standard, we got network, we will get at some point hopefully networking in the standard. And this is another one of those, you know, input output things which is just not portably doable today. Um, so the question is, does that belong in the standard library? And this is um, from, uh, I think, uh, some slides from Bryce, who's the uh, Lugi uh, chair on the committee where they had this discussion about uh, what belongs in the standard library. Well, okay, so standardized existing practice, right? So things that belong in the standard are things that have been designed, they're not gonna change, there's not gonna be any groundbreaking changes in what the way it's done. Uh, stuff that people have implemented, that people have experienced with, people have used. And then um, things that go into standard library need to address a clear need. So either they're like, very, very commonly used functionality like a vector, or it enca encapsulates norm portability, like file system, networking, etc. Or it's difficult to implement correctly, or it requires language support. And if you look at audio, it certainly fits all of these boxes. And it certainly also uh, ticks those two boxes. So again, if you look at this uh, quote, I think this low level is a good candidate for the C++ standard library. Which brings me to the next section of the talk, which is a proposal to do just that. So um, this is kind of, uh, maybe I have some time to um, kind of tell a little bit the story about this. So uh, I did a talk about how you do audio in C++ um, like in general. Uh, at CPPCon 2015, and then I was kind of, after that I was thinking, like in the back of my head I had this, this thing that maybe, you know, someone, someone should write a proposal like this. But I didn't really have time to, to um, uh, do it, and then I thought, ah, the committee is not going to be, it's like too niche anyway, so I, I didn't spend time on this. And then in 2016, I, I joined the C++ standard committee, and I met Guy Davidson, whom some of you may know, who is the author of the graphics, 2D, one of the authors of the 2D graphics proposal which is another one of those things that are not portably doable in C++ today. And, and we started talking, um, and, and we started talking about audio somehow because kind of we said graphics, uh, kind of user input and audio, those are kind of the three things you need to basically do even the simplest kind of app. Um, and then you said, hey, there is this um, other guy whose name is also Guy, Guy Somberg, um, who uh, is thinking about proposing audio for the standard library. 
And and I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about the same thing. So maybe we should, we should meet, we should talk about this. And it was really nice because Guy Somberg, so we then uh, started talking, exchanging emails. Uh, it turned out Guy Somberg is one of the world leading experts on audio for video games. Uh, he actually wrote uh, two books about audio for video games. I know nothing about video games. Uh, I'm a kind of professional uh, uh, kind of music software person. So, um, so we came from two different industries and we both wanted to do this API. And then we started designing it on the fly, so sort of, to sort of say. And then it turned out, yeah, we both kind of coming from these completely different directions. We both agree what the lower level is. This is basically what I've talked about for the last half hour. This is kind of, if you have that, you can do everything else on top in a portable way. So, so you just need to standardize this kind of, this low level. And then, and then basically you have everything or you can do everything. Um, so then uh, we kind of started designing this API. Um, and then uh, basically the idea was let's not invent anything. Let's not come up with some, something new. Let's just take all these like cross-platform middleware libraries that already do this since decades. And let's kind of find just a common denominator and, and maybe um, write that down in kind of more modern C++. And, and that's going to be this API. So there's no kind of really new, it's not really something new. It's basically like taking all the existing practice together and kind of finding like the, the most kind of common, common denominator and then you know, translating that into a modern C++ API. So this is what we've done, and he presented this at the Audio Developer Conference in November 2018 for the first time, which is a conference for pro audio people. And there were these are the three of us presenting this, and there were a bunch of people in the room. Uh, it was packed, and everyone said, "Yeah, we like this. This is really cool." We said, "Yeah, we have all these like we are writing all these like libraries that talk to these devices and all these platforms. You, you have to maintain all this stuff. It's really annoying." Like, wouldn't it be nice if you wouldn't have to do that? Or we have to like, you know, buy proprietary software to do this. Wouldn't it be nice if it came with the compiler for free? So everyone was kind of super happy with uh, this direction, which was, you know, not expected. I thought maybe the reception would not be as positive, but it was, so that was good. So, um, and the other thing that also happened in November, so if you know kind of how the C++ committee is organized, they have uh, kind of these main groups um, actually, now they have uh, also the two incubator groups they're missing here. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The green boxes are the different study groups for kind of industry-specific areas. And there's one here, which is SG13, which is the study group for human-machine interaction and input-output. And they met also in November in San Diego at the committee meeting. I was there. Uh, they were mainly talking about the 2D graphics proposal and the kind of latest iteration of that. But then there was a little bit of time uh, left and I was in the room and I said, hey, you know, me and these two other guys, um, it's funny because I say guys, but they're, they're both actually called guys. So, they're, they're <laughs> so this is one of the instances where it's actually okay to say guys because they're both literally called guy. Um, so when I write emails, I also say, I always say hi guys and I start with a capital G. So that uh, joke never gets old. Um, so these two guys, uh, they were not there, but I was there and I said, hey, you know, we are, we are thinking about writing this up. Would this be interesting for you? Is this something that, you know, belongs in the study group? Do you even think there is a possibility we could consider this? And then the people in the room said, yes, we want this. This is cool. Please write it up and bring it to the next committee meeting. And then we did that. So we wrote uh, the first um, revision of this proposal, which is basically proposing a standard audio API for C++. Um, this is not like formal wording yet, it's more kind of like the design kind of... Um, and, and we presented this um, R0, this kind of first revision, uh, at the next meeting, which was in February in Kona, in Hawaii. Beautiful place. Um, unfortunately, you don't get to really explore any of this stuff because you're stuck in a room like this for six days looking at code. Um, but uh, so... We presented this R0 version there, and <coughs> again, the reception was positive. We actually presented it both in SG13 and in Lugi. And it was interesting because uh, there's no other, there were no other audio experts uh, in the room, um, but there were a lot of uh, standard library experts, and they gave, gave us a lot of feedback on, on the API and how to make it such that it fits better into the standard library. And um, yeah, so with all that feedback, you know, we returned from Hawaii and wrote up R1 which is in the post Kona mailing. Uh, so that's the one that's currently um, 
online, uh, if you go to wg21 that dot link slash p1386, you're going to get this. Uh, this is not the newest um, revision yet, uh, because there's going to be an upcoming meeting in Cologne in July, and there we're going to present the next revision because we got more feedback on this and we solved more problems. So another thing that happened in Kona is that we got feedback from um, one of the big kind of operating system slash hardware vendors who do have a very good audio stack and they gave us some feedback about, you know, if they were to implement this API for their system, you know, maybe we should kind of change this and add this and this other thing that's really important that we overlooked. So we took all this feedback and now we're in the process of writing up the R2, which is the third revision of this. Uh, and this is the one that we're going to be presenting in Cologne uh, two months from now. And it starts to uh, look really good. And it's not just like made up API on paper. We actually have a reference implementation of all this stuff. It's not, um, not everything that I have on the slides is in there yet. It's kind of a bit like about a month out of date. But it works. It works on macOS currently. Uh, we didn't write the Windows or Linux implementations yet, but we hope to do so before Cologne. And if anyone wants to help, please. Um, so, um, yes, this works. We're going to show, s we're going to see some code later, uh, actually running code. Um, this is public. You can check it out. So the next, uh, half an hour or so, I will go through this API and also, uh, kind of highlight the, um, latest changes that we have in R2. So basically, uh, this API, it's simple. It's a small library. The, the Mac OS implementation of this whole thing is like, about 500 lines of code now. So it's, it's really not that much. Um, so we have basically these four classes. We have the audio buffer, which is what we saw as kind of the data structure that we need. We have the audio device, which is the handle to the, um, to the sound card. We have this class audio device IO, which is, uh, we're going to see later what that is. And then we have audio device list, which is a list of the audio devices you have available, obviously. So we only have these four classes. Um, the audio buffer, looks like this. Um, so basically, it has a size. And we have these four size functions. Maybe you don't need all four of them. Not sure yet. But basically, um, you, can get, you can basically ask you know, how many samples, frames, channels are in the buffer. And then you have this operator, paren paren, with, which can access a single sample by frame and by channel. Uh, so it's a bit like a 2D span sort of thing, essentially. It's not owning. It's like a, just a kind of a span-like wrapper around this kind of 2D data structure that holds the audio data that you want to read and write. OK. Um, by the way, if, if anyone has questions, just feel free to interrupt me. This is kind of uh, uh, not a problem. So um, yes. Yeah. And this appears to be both. Yes, this is both. Um, can you just talk about the decision for that? Uh, why? I mean, if, if, if it's readable, then you know, we can make it const. But like, there is, I don't see a value in having like, a different type for a read buffer and a write buffer, because the, it's the same kind of data. So I don't see value in that distinction. Like other, um, for example, core audio, that was just the, the, the Mac API <coughs> doesn't distinguish between them. I think most other APIs don't in terms of just the data type that you use. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe there's a good reason that I've overlooked why we should have, but I, I'm not aware of one. Yes, Kaspar. Um, is there a reason you're not calling it the uh, colon colon audio colon colon buffer? Yes, there is. The question was, why do we not call it audio colon colon buffer, but audio underscore buffer? Actually, in R0, it was audio colon colon buffer. And then uh, there were some comments from Titus, specifically, who has a paper on this about how nested namespaces are bad and uh, why there are good reasons not to use them. And I don't have time to talk about this, but there is a paper uh, from Titus Winters talking about this stuff. So there are good reasons why we then chose in R1 to switch from audio colon colon to audio underscore and have it all in flat and namespace still. Um, so yes, Andre. Um, begin end, like iterator interface, I think there was one at the beginning, right? Yes, we're going to talk about this later. Oh. Um, so yeah, there is no iterator interface. There's just this operator thing, which is basically uh, the same interface as MD span, which is not in C++ 20. Unfortunately, it just didn't make it. But hopefully, we're going to um, 
get it in C++23, which is MD span is basically a multi-dimensional version of span, and it, ha it has the same interface. It has this kind of operator colon colon, uh, sorry, operator paren paren, and it has no iterator interface. There's reasons for that. We're going we're gonna to come to that later. So this is uh, similar to, to MD span in, in this sense. Um, right. The second important class is the audio device, which is the, your handle to the actual sound card you're going to be talking to. So what do you need? Every device has a name, right? If you, if you look into um, your settings, it's going to say something like, you know, microphone input or like default output or whatever, or like the name of your sound card. So it has a human readable name, which is a string. And then that's not quite enough because you can, for example, have uh, two, uh, if you have like an external audio interface, you can have two of the same kind and they would, on some platforms, they might have the same name, but you still want to distinguish them. So they also need IDs. So every device also has a unique ID. Uh, the, the concrete like integer type to represent this is, is not important. It's like some integer type. And then it has these properties. So it's either an input device or an output device or both. And it has some input channels or some output channels or both. Um, so if is input is false, then get num input channels is going to be zero. Nothing surprising here. Right. Then it has some the, of these uh, properties. So it has a sample rate, right? So sample rate, that's actually interesting. So you would think sample rate would be an integer, but actually on some platforms it's a, it's a double. Um, so um, we say, okay, this is just a type def, some numeric type. Um, so you can obviously get the sample rate, you can set the sample rate, and then not every possible sample rate is supported. Typically, you only have like three or four options, so you want to be able to uh, basically query which ones are supported. Um, and then maybe you can display them as options or whatever. And then the sa same stuff for the buffer size. Uh, so this is another property that you want to set and get. Um, again, nothing surprising here. And then how do you actually talk to it? So um, we said it's kind of this kind of callback threat stuff going on. So you need to be able to start the device and stop it and, and see if it's running. And now this is kind of, uh, if you're used to kind of error AI and C++, this might be weird. You might expect that you want to start the device in the constructor and then stop it in the destructor. And actually it does stop in the destructor. But there's reasons why you don't want it to start immediately. There's reasons why, for example, you want to uh, get the device, get a handle to this device, then ask it, okay, can you use this sample rate? Can you do this? Can you do that? and then set the parameters in the way you want and then start it. And this is how it is in the published version, in the R1 version. Turns out this is not quite uh, what we need here because um, this doesn't work. So an interesting property is that even if you say, okay, give me this sa sample rate, I want to work with this sample rate, the device might still say no. Like I, I decided that now I don't support this sample rate anymore. So, so you can ask it to do like 44,000 hertz, uh, 4,400 hertz, but then it can still decide to do 48,000 hertz instead. But um, basically, when you call start, what's going to happen is it's going to start calling your callback. But then if you have um, like code that's actually generating sound or even just playing back a file, that depends on the sample. You need to know the sample rate before you start doing any processing, uh, which means, well, okay, so you can set the sample rate and so say, I want the sample rate. But then if you actually do start, what you need is you need a callback, uh, and then the device is going to start, and that's typically going to happen on another thread. Or some, on some systems, it's going to happen on another thread. And then on this other thread, the device is going to actually start, actually decide what sample rate it's going to be, and then you need a callback <coughs> where you can say, okay, what's now your actual sample rate? Okay, now I can actually set up my objects, do my kind of, kind of setup stuff. And after that, I'm ready to do processing. And then the device starts calling your callback. So this is why you need the start stuff. And you need also a stopped callback as well, because you want to, want to clean up some of your resources. And you might ask yourself, why is the stopped callback not in the stop function? And the reason is the device might stop not only when you stop it yourself, but also if you just yank out the cable or something else changes on your system, the device might stop before like you can't control that. And, and so you, you need to get this asynchronous callback when that happens. And um, so um, then the question is, what is this uh, type? And um, uh, so the first uh, consideration was maybe it should just be a std function, right? Because that supports everything. Um, then um, 
actually there was a discussion on the committee reflector about how, how we should do these things because there is currently in C++ no accepted way of this is how callbacks work in C++. There's like a few places in the standard where we have something like callbacks, uh, uh, but not really like this, not in an asynchronous way. So there's no standard yet for how we do asynchronous callbacks. Uh, there is some work being done uh, like for networking, for executors, but this is really kind of different for a number of reasons. Um, like for example, uh, what the uh, kind of async people do is um, they have kind of more sophisticated ways of doing callbacks where you can kind of control whether it's synchronous or asynchronous and you can kind of uh, control you know, whether you're going to synchronize it with locks and also there's a way of getting errors. None of this is needed for audio because you don't control what thread this is going to be on. Um, you're not going to want to use any locks or mutexes or any synchronization implicitly. Uh, and also errors, you don't really need errors because well, if, if the device didn't start, you just don't get the callback. So, so this is mu much simpler. Uh, but anyway, like wh what should this type be? So um, set function is probably not good. Uh, in C++ 20, we're gonna get this um, new one, any invocable, which is essentially a um, uh, basically non-copyable function and plus a few bug fixes. It's this, uh, this paper. So this looks better, but still, you know, it's going to allocate memory and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, maybe the way you store this callback in the device is actually an implementation detail. And what we should be doing is something like this, where it's just a template uh, and that's going to match any callable. Now, the problem here is that now we lost the information, what kind of function it should be, what kind of callable should it be, what parameters does it take? And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the solution to this in C20 is to just introduce a concept for that and saying we have a concept and we have this audio device callback which is like any invocable that takes basically this kind of parameter and then uh, you just have this, uh, you just take one of the, you just take any type that matches this concept. Unfortunately, I have to write template blah 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 requires because this is this case where we have the same concept twice, but they can actually be different types. So you can't express this with the short hand syntax. So this is an example where you need the, the long form. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. You, you can you reverse that, right? Like the, the two don't have to, they aren't coupled now. Oh, yes. You're right. So I can actually write all your device callback auto started, all your device callback auto stopped. Yeah. And they can, yes, of course. You Thank you. Yes. Okay, so you don't need this long form, you can just write it shorter. Great, but this is essentially what you need to do. And I think this is the correct way of doing these callbacks. Please correct me if anyone has a different opinion on this, because this is really important. What do you think that you need to store it? That's an implementation detail. I will probably use uh, the std invocable, but internally, you're not gonna see it as a user. I think that's the correct way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, Michael. Does that then imply that it has owning um, semantics? Yes, so this would have owning semantics. Like if you, so, so if you have a, um, I don't know, some kind of lambda or whatever, you just give it to the device and the device is gonna store that internally. Does that mean you should get it by value? <coughs> well, it means you're gonna get it by ref ref, which is exactly what happens here. And you get it by value. Wouldn't it be better to get it by value? Um, if, you're, if you're gonna get an owning copy, you don't want to only copy, you just want to move it in. <coughs> Michael? Yeah. And it, is there a reason not to use something like a function ref or a non owning? Um, mm, <sighs> let's discuss it. Let's discuss it later. I just wondered if there was a. So, so yeah, may maybe, maybe this is not the only way of doing it. So this is the right way to do it. No, this is the right way. Okay, I think this is the right way. It is. Okay, cool. Uh, if you don't think it's the right way, let's discuss it later because you only have 30 minutes left and there's a lot of slides. Okay. So, so now we can uh, start the device. We can get a start and sub callback. Uh, the next thing is we need to exchange data with the device, right? So we need to exchange actually buffers. How does this work? And for this, we have um, this type, audio device IO. I think in the published version, it's called something different, but now it's called audio device IO. Oh, so it was called audio device buffers with an S. Now it's called audio device IO. And this basically contains all the data that you're gonna be exchanging with the device. And in the published version of the paper in R1, 
um, it just contains uh, basically your input buffer and your output buffer. And typically, you're only going to get one of those. But in some cases, you can get both if it's an input and output device. So this is why they're optional. And this is an R1. And then one of the um, pieces of feedback we got from, from uh, uh, vendors is that, well, you're missing uh, a very important uh, use case here, which is uh, you're missing timestamps. And they're really important. Like, for example, if you just want to play back a file, it doesn't matter. But what happens if you have audio and then you want to sync that to some video? Right? You need to know when the current buffer that you're filling, when, like, the time when it will be uh, put outside of the speakers, like the presentation time. And equally, uh, if you have input, you want to know at what point in time this input was physically received by your device, right? And, and those are different, right? So the input time will be before now, and the presentation time will be after now. Imagine also if you have kind of input and output going on. Imagine you have something like, um, you know, you're, you're talking into your microphone, and then that goes out the speakers, so it has kind of round trip latency, and then you want to you want to do a feedback suppression. So you need to kind of know what the latency of your system is, right? Um, which is why in R2, we introduced timestamps. Um, and this is going to be the time when the buffer was received and the time which is the system's best idea of what the presentation time of this buffer, of the output buffer, is going to be. And they're also both optional because you might be on a system where you don't have that information. Um, yeah, so that's the uh, audio device I.O. class. This is what you get in your callback? This is what you get in your callback. So, this is the second type of callback. It's the audio I.O. callback, and that's the really important callback. That's the one that you actually use to do stuff. Um, so, um, what you can do with this device is you can say, hey, I want to connect this callback, and that's going to be the actual processing callback, the, the thing that actually makes sound. And then that is, um, has this signature. And here I'm using the short form syntax. And I'm going to use that in the other one as well. This is really nice. I love this feature. Um, it really changes the way you design library APIs. It's, it's wonderful. Um, so um, this is a callback that takes a reference to a device, because you might want to ask the device what it is. And, and then it takes a reference to this audio device I.O., which contains the buffers and the timestamps. And this is, this is what you're going to get. Uh, you're going to see that in actual code in a minute. But um, <coughs> yeah, so this is kind of the most important call. You have one of these callbacks, which is actually doing stuff. And then you say, connect this to the audio device. And then what happens here in this case is, if you call connect, the operating system is going to, under the covers, spool up a real-time processing thread. And then it's going to start calling this callback on this other processing thread, which is happening under the hood. So the operating system controls that. So this is not the only way to do audio. Uh, for example, core audio on Mac on, on iOS works like this, where you don't have any control over this thread. It's a thread owned by the system somewhere. And the only thing you can do is, here's my callback. And then you're going to get called on this other thread. On Wasapi, which is one of the Windows APIs, it's a bit different. There, you create this processing thread yourself, and then you're yourself responsible for saying, this has high priority. And then you are, you are controlling the thread. So there's these two ways of doing it, which is kind of push and pull based. And in the pull based processing, you control the thread. And you say, OK, wait until the next buffer arrives, and then call process. So call this callback with the new buffer. And now it's a ref. It's not a ref ref. So now it's, it's not owning, because you own the callback. And you're just going like, to wait and block until you know, there's new data, or until there's, it's time to write out the next block of data. And then you have to manually call process to do that. And you do that in a loop. So you have like a wait process loop. So this is the other way of doing audio I.O. And you kind of need to support both. Because for example, on a Mac, you cannot do wait process because you don't control the thread. Uh, conversely, on an embedded system where you might not have threads, the system might not be able to even spool up a thread under the covers. Uh, the only thing you, you might have is the other one. The, you can only do wait process. And may, may, maybe then even wait will be a no op. And you just directly do process. So this really depends on the system. Kashpa? Will you support something like uh, is ready? Because I can think back to working on a microcontroller where I would you know, do some small thing and then check if the audio thing is ready to, to be filled again. And then if it wasn't, if I was too fast, I would go do some other thing 
So the comment was, instead of having the blocking wait, have a non-blocking check whether there's data or not. And yeah, maybe we should add that. It's not really a thing on kind of desktop and, and, and phones. Uh, if you only have one thread, period. But if you only have one thread, period, like on an embedded system, then maybe that's a useful addition. Thank you for this comment. Let's, uh, let's consider it. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, so just for completeness, you might also have wait for and wait until. And then again, as I said, some systems only support push-based and some other systems only support pull-based. So you might want to have functions which, which you can check at compile time, ideally, which one of those you can use. Right. Now, the last class that we need is the device list. So this is a screenshot of my Mac. You have several devices. You need to choose, you need to have an API to kind of see which devices are there and then choose one. So this is the API that, that we have, which is very similar to you know, how everyone else is doing it. So you can, you can ask, what's the system's default input device and default output device? That's like the one that you would have configured here, like the blue selected one. You might not have one, so which is why it's optional. And you can also say, give me all available input devices, give me all available output devices. And then you have this kind of audio device list, which is just like a very stupid uh, list. This is um, basically the same API as um, the TZDB list in C++20, which is just like a very simple kind of, you don't need any kind of elaborate interface. You just need to be able to iterate through it. Question. Yes. Well, so so the audio device class is just a handle, right? So if you get if you get uh, uh, if you iterate through it, you get a device, and then in the meantime that device is gone, then you're just not going to be able to connect to it. You're going to get an error if you try to start it or connect to it. And then you might want to say, okay, well something changed, the device is not there anymore, and then handle that. Um, like for example, if if we have this case where you yank out the device while the app is running. Some apps might want to do something like this. They want to explicitly detect this case, which is why you need one more callback. That's the last callback that we need, which is the uh, audio device list callback. This is a pretty long name. If anyone can come up with a better one, please let me know. But you need a callback if the list of audio devices changes. And, and this solves the problem that you just mentioned. Right? So if, while you're iterating through it, this is all kind of thread safe, right? Because the handle, if the device goes away, like the handle is kind of still there while you iterate through the list. Because you, you get this list, this list is going to be stable, this is not racy. But then while you're doing that, you might get this callback, and then you might want to throw away the list and get a new version of the list and then iterate that again. What's the, what, what is going to call this callback? Uh, uh, implementation defined thread when something changes. You don't know how it's going to be called. So this is going to only push? Uh, this has nothing to do with processing. This is just this is kind of the another level of the operating I system which controls. I agree yeah. It has nothing to do with processing, but I just don't see what other opportunity the app or thread has to call this function for you. Like what other I opportunity the app has to call this? I mean, like if you're a single thread and this thread is in my user code, what, where where is it going to call this callback? Um, so if you are on a system that doesn't have threads you typically wouldn't have multiple devices coming and going. You would just have like, this is your device, it's uh, hardwired, you're going to talk to this buffer all the time. So, so is there like a control thread that was set up at the start somewhere? Implementation defined. Different operating systems doing it different, in different ways. We can't mandate any of that. Oh. Uh, ben? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Were you no, no, I think I understood. Um, so this callback is, when I receive this callback, is there a reason why I don't, it doesn't automatically give me the new device list? Uh, the question was, why does it not give you automatically the new device list? And the answer is, yeah, maybe we should have this as a, as a parameter here. Yeah? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't. You can either query it yourself, or you can just the system can pass it in, <laughs> into the callback as an, as an argument, like a reference to it or whatever. Uh, or like actually not a reference, but maybe by copy, because so it, it's not racing. Yeah? May, if you feel that's better, we can do that. Just these are the kinds of changes that we still have can make. Yeah, definitely. I'm assuming that if I get this callback, I'd be expected to re-enumerate the devices. Would that be the yeah, thing? well, you would call the get audio yeah. input. So, so there's two lists, right? So you might be interested in, in both or one of them. 
So you would have to pass both of them in, and then kind of it becomes long. But maybe that's better. I don't know. Let's let's discuss it afterwards. It's not really uh, super important. I think we can we can do what you say. I don't see a, a problem with that. I yes. Know. You don't need the list if you are on the default device and it doesn't go away. Like if you have a system where you have tens or hundreds of devices coming uh, and going, but you are still on the default, then it would be a lot of copy yeah, of this well list. Well, I would still need to call something to determine that <coughs> was true. Yeah, there is that. I don't yeah, know what the best device. Is, yeah. Yeah, but assuming I get this callback, I I don't know that I'm, the default device is still available. It might have changed. Like I, I'm going to need to call something to find out what the new state is after I get this callback. Well, you're going to call the get audio input device yeah, list. Exactly. So I so I don't know what the what the best answer is to put the, put that on the caller or to maybe populate the callback. I think I think it's in my opinion uh, this is better. Put it on the caller because you might only be <coughs> interested in one of the lists. You might not be interested in them at all. Uh, because you just have, you received this stopped callback, so maybe you just want to say, yeah, okay, then I'm going to quit the app or whatever. So there's different ways you can react to this, which is why I feel like this is kind of more open-ended. But if, if there's good reasons why we should pass the lists in, you can do that too. Like, I don't have any strong opinion about that. And I don't want to spend too much time on this detail because it's not super important. Uh, yes? So what, uh, how do I, so I guess it seems like if I'm giving you a callback, that could be called at any time. I might want to revoke it later because I'm planning a shutdown and I no longer want to. What do you mean by revoke it later? Well, I've had people think it's going to call into my code. At yeah. some point, I may want to destroy the objects that that was going to call into, and I don't want you to call my callback anymore. OK, well, then pass in uh, like an empty lambda. OK, so, that, so it's, just, it's an overriding type option. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if you need multiple callbacks, you need to do the dispatch yourself. This is like super bare bones stuff. You have only one callback that you can register. Uh, yeah, we have 18 minutes left, and I want to do now the live coding demo. So do you want to spend more time on this callback stuff? or? Uh, you, you mentioned the stopped callback, and I was just wondering if the, uh, the guaranteed ordering, like if I pull out the device which is playing back, yeah. I get the changed callback, and I'll also, will I also get the stopped callback? Yes, callback? yes, you and get both. A guaranteed ordering of those? No, but there is an important guarantee about the start and stop callback, which is why it needs to be asynchronous in the first place. So there is, so you want to set up and tear down stuff that you need in a processing callback. So the really important guarantee here is that you get the start callback before you get the first processing callback. And you have the other guarantees. At the point where you get the stop callback, you're guaranteed that you're not going to get any processing callbacks anymore. So there's an ordering start callback, processing callbacks, stop callback. And this is the really important ordering because then you can't have any races between start, stop, and your processing code. Uh, the the one that you mentioned, I think you would the the uh, device list changed callback. I think typically would be done on on like the not the processing thread, but kind of some kind of main message loop thread kind of thing. So that would be there would be probably no guarantees for that particular callback. Yeah, good. Uh, okay, live demo. Let's see let's see if that works. So I'm going to switch the display now. Ooh, this is going to go wrong. All right. So this is probably very small, so I should um, I should um, huh? Is this better? Yeah, I think this is better. Uh, right. So. Um, so this is the library. Again, it's on GitHub. Um, here it is. This is the URL. You can check it out. You can play with it. It's cool. It's also very lightweight and small. And apart from some of the R2 things that I mentioned, everything is in there. Um, OK, so first, first app is really, really um, simple. Actually, that's incorrect. That's two seconds. So this is all. This is everything there is. This fits on one screen. So we have this include audio stuff, which is really cool, <coughs> I think. And it's currently in namespace std experimental. Um, and then what happens here is, OK, you have a, so this is generating white noise. So this is basically just taking the buffer and writing random numbers between minus 1 and 1 into it. So there's not nothing complicated going on. So we need to set up our little random generator. And then we get the default audio output device. And then, oh, I, 
I didn't mention this explicitly, but the uh, buffer has a template parameter, which is the sample type, which means that the callback also has the same template parameter, right? So by, by connecting a callback that has float, you're saying I'm requesting float as a sample type. Yeah, so that's really cool. This is how you do the kind of runtime um, thing that you can have different sample types. So you're requesting um, uh, float as the type, which is what you're going to be using anyway. That's the default on a Mac or, or on any uh, desktop platform for that matter. Um, so, and then you connect your callback, which is just a lambda, so it's just in line. And so you're just going to check, probably this, um, so you're just going to check um, whether the output buffer, whether there's an output buffer. This is not really necessary because you know that you have requested an output device, so you could actually leave that out. Um, so you're going to get an output buffer, you're going to loop all the frames and channels, and you're just going to write uh, kind of a random number into every sample. And then if I run this, um, this is white noise. Make sound, yay. Slightly more complicated example. This is a sine wave. So it's a little bit more code, but not much. It still fits on one screen, actually. So this plays a, plays a sine wave where, OK, same stuff, but now you have a, basically like a thing that generates a sine wave. So the frequency depends on the sample rate, right? So you need to do calculate like by how much the increment is of every new sample. That depends on the sample rate. And then you're just going to, again, loop over all frames, get the next value, loop over all channels, and just write. So we need this here because you want to write the same value into, into every channel, right? So you can't just loop over. So you need to write it like this. Uh, and if you run this thing, that's a sine wave. And just to prove that I'm not cheating, let's change this number. And you're going to get a different frequency. All right. Yes? Is the out in a strong dimension on one of the slides, is the out interleaved or non interleaved? We can't, we're going to come to that. Um, oh, we have 12 minutes left. I need to hurry up. OK, a little melody, uh, a bit more code. So, what this does is it has a bunch of notes and then it has a little synthesizer going on which creates like a, it's, this is a very crude and not optimal way of creating a square wave, which is typically what you would get on old sound chips. This is still just 90 lines of code. If you run this thing, it's going to play a little melody. And you can actually write this in half the code by using, by wrapping this thing into like a coroutine instead of a struct. Uh, which is really cool, but um, I'm not going to show this now. Um, so, oh yeah, this is the kind of boring one, print devices. So what this is going to do is it's just going to do the device iteration thing. So it just you know enumerates the devices and tells you how they're configured. So it's kind of this thing. So this this is a little example to um, for for these device lists. And then the last um, example is something that uses input. Uh, which is the level meter. So it's a very crude way of measuring the uh, input volume. So what this does, it iterates now over the input and kind of just calculates kind of the average absolute value of the samples in some regular interval. And this, uh, funny enough, doesn't run uh, in the debugger here of, of C-Line because apparently macOS, you the app needs kind of like the permission to access the microphone and somehow it doesn't work inside the debugger. I haven't figured out yet why. So if I run this, uh, I'm not going to get anything interesting. So I need to run this uh, on the in the terminal outside of the debugger. I don't know why. Um, so I'm just going to quickly do that. Um, right. So this is now outputting the current uh, level. And if I do something like this, you see the number goes up. So it measures the um, and if you, if you would do this in a little bit more clever way, you could have like a proper level meter. Uh, all right, so th these are the examples. This is the implement like so. This is kind of the implementation. The Mac implementation is this stuff. Has about 500 lines of code. That's it. That's the whole thing. Let's go back to the slides. We don't have much time. Um, uh, 
Live demo. All right. All right. So this is what we have now. I think this is cool. Um, there's two problems. One is someone mentioned interleaved, non interleaved. <coughs> so, yes, there are two different possible um, ways how this audio buffer can be arranged. And so in R0, we had um, this, we tried to do this kind of iterator interface where you get um, uh, an iterator to the frames, and then for each frame, you get an iterator to the samples, or you could do it the other way around, where you get an iterator to the channels, and then you, for each channel, you get an iterator to the samples. So you have this kind of nested iterator thing. And then they, they were done in this clever way where it just knows, okay, so wh whether interleaved or deinterleaved was a template parameter, and then kind of, so you don't have to do this at runtime, you don't have to pay the cost for that. And then these iter iterates were set up in this really clever way that they kind of know how to loop over it. But it turns out it doesn't work. Because as soon as you have like 2D levels of iterators, you run into this view of views problem, which is kind of really subtle, where if you have an iterator to a frame, which itself consists of several samples, this frame itself is not an object that exists. So, so you would return an iterator to something that is not actually an element of the underlying container. So you can't have a reference to it, you need to return by value, and then it's not really a container anymore. A bit like vector bool, right? It's kind of this kind of problem. So, so like, it, it just doesn't work. Like you could do it with like ranges uh, without having containers, but um, so what happened in Kona is um, I talked to the um, people who implemented MD span because several of them were there. That was really cool because they ran into the exact same problem, except that this is 2D and for them it's like whatever D, but it's literally the same problem for MD span. And they just said, yeah, we, we didn't do this. Um, we, just, we just have this kind of, uh, uh, operator access, and they have operator paren paren, and they eventually want to replace it with operator uh, array access. Doesn't work currently for multidimensional because you have if you you can't have nested, you can't really have these nested square bracket operators. Yeah. So we have a paper where we say we deprecate the, the use of the comma operator inside in 20, and then we ha when we have that, we can get the other the proper multidimensional square bracket operator in 23. But we're not there yet. So in the meantime, we have operator paren paren, and this is exactly what the MD span people use. So after Kona, the R1 version, which is currently public, we said, okay, screw this iterator interface, we're just gonna do MD span. So audio buffer is just going to be like a wrapper around. So the underlying thing will be just MD span. It's gonna have the same interface. And that was fine until uh, we forgot another problem, which is in audio, if you have interleaved and deinterleaved, typically interleaved buffers are represented like this, where they're contiguous in memory. But deinterleaved buffers are typically like this, where they're not contiguous in memory, but you actually have another array which has pointers to these. So it's like an array of arrays thing, but it's not necessarily contiguous in memory. And typically interleaved would be contiguous and deinterleaved would be non-contiguous. And then you're facing the problem that you kind of have to represent both interleaved, deinterleaved, and also contiguous or pointer to pointer, all in the same type. And then we had like another template parameter, which was whether it's contiguous or not. And then it became really horrible. And you can kind of do this in MD span by hacking the, uh, like I think the fourth template parameter of MD span lets you kind of hack around this thing, but it's just not. It's not. It's not really working. So, um, so what existing audio APIs do? They either do, you know, they say. Interleave contiguous, or they say, okay, it's deinterleave non contiguous, and you get pointers to pointers. And practically all audio APIs just say, this is what we're using. Uh, or at least they have two different types, and you can kind of convert between the two. The only one I'm aware of that crams both this and that into the same type is Apple, which have this audio buffer list uh, uh, type. And it's really. I, I think most people don't understand how Apple's audio buffer list really works. It's really not obvious. I didn't understand it for a very long time. So it's not um, something that we would like to put in a modern C++ API. So how we solve this problem in R2 is we just say, okay, we have this audio buffer type, and then um, the underlying layer is implementation defined. We don't care. And then also this means that you can't create one of those because you don't know 
what it is. So you're just going to get this from the system. And you're going to be able to uh, iterate over it you know, using this access operator, but it's implementation defined whether how that is stored. And then if you want, you know, you, you want to do different things when you want to, like if you want to play back a file, you want to do interleave because you're going by frames. If you want to do like an algorithm where you do like an FFT, you want to do it per channel where you have like the whole channel as a chunk and you kind of FFT it, do some stuff, FFT it back per channel. And if you want to do this kind of stuff, then what you need to do is you need to take this and then you know, copy it out in the right way into one of your own containers and there you know what the layout is. And there you can do what you want. And, and then you don't have a problem, it's portable, it's fine. Yes, Andre. Suppose you could say something that, because if you have just a single interface and you, go, if you want to copy out all efficiently, you would actually access it sample by sample and maybe you want to have like copy two or something. I mean, it's not nice, but it's yeah. going to be efficient. But I just, if I just think about computer in my company, then this would be maybe. Yeah. So the problem with this interface is that you don't know which way. So there's different ways of looping around this thing, and you don't know which way is going to be the most efficient one. So you might want to have some additional methods to query that. And yes, maybe, probably. Let's talk about that later. I, I have not decided yet what that would have to look like. Maybe you have an idea. Let's talk about it afterwards. Gaspar. Um, like yes, let's have this conversation. I, I'd love to have this conversation. Um, and the next problem is a more nasty problem where, so on some systems like Windows, this is again a screenshot from um, Ableton Live, uh, on some systems like Windows, you have more than one API you can talk to, right? And, and, and they have different properties. Like on Windows specifically, you have ASIO, which is kind of the older API, which o uh, basically offers you lower latency which, which makes, it's important, right? It's, it's an important property. Uh, but then not all sound cards might have an ASIO driver. So then you have the kind of more newer APIs, which support more devices, but then they have ba basically not quite as good performance characteristics. So if you're doing professional audio stuff, you might want to choose which driver API you want to use. And then each one of those comes with its own device list, right? So, um, and then also you might, you so you might have these different drivers and you might have even another driver which is kind of a null driver which just does nothing. So, so you have like one more level, right? You have kind of devices, a list of devices and then you have a list of drivers and each one have a list of devices. And you can do this at runtime. Uh, this is what like for example Juice does. It's like a runtime thing where you iterate through um, you can iterate through the different drivers and then, but then it, it, it's not really C++ -y in, in, in a standard D's kind of way. So what we try to do is you try to do it at compile time where, well, okay, so we have these like not driver types and then um, basically you have like a default driver, which is, you know, going to be one of those. And then you have the other ones, which are kind of implementation defined. Um, and then the d audio device now is a template on the driver type. So you can do that at runtime or at compile time, right? So if you do it at compile time, if you do it at runtime, you're going to have polymorphism and all this stuff. If you do it at compile time, you're going to have this. And then the, the device is going to have a template parameter, which is the driver type. The device list is going to have a driver type uh, parameter. The, all, the, this whole API, every one of those methods will have a driver type uh, template parameter. And this trickles through the whole API, right? Because every driver might have a different clock type. So your timestamps might have different types, so your buffer needs to have a, a driver template parameter as well, and then that trickles through to the callback. So now if you're writing the callback, you need to know what driver type you're writing against, and this kind of defeats the purpose of writing portable code. Like we tried to do this, this is what we have in, in, in R1, but in the repository, which is online now, we ripped it all out again. We're not going to do this because we, like, this doesn't work. It results in an API that's and then you need to come up with yet another API to loop through these drivers at compile time, at runtime. Do you define like a tuple of, of available drivers? How do you loop through it? It becomes horrible. Or you do this whole thing at runtime, and then you end up with like a runtime polymorphism kind of API, which is also not nice. And then, so what we want to do is we want to like hide this complexity, and, and we don't see an easy way of doing this. So for now, we're going to say, screw all this. Uh, we're not going to do this. If you need different driver types, sorry. So, can you hide the runtime polymorphism with a type erase? 
can you hide the runtime array, uh, uh, the runtime polymorphism thing with the type arrays, type erasure? I guess, yeah, this is what I think I tried in my very first attempt to implement this, which didn't look nice. Maybe, maybe there's a better way of doing it. So the important thing is that the vast majority of, of people will not care, right? So this is a very, very niche thing where you have to like, distinguish these driver types. So I don't want to impose an API on 99% of people to get this 1% case. I think we're out of time, right? So can I have one more minute for just a summary? Yeah. Uh, so the only other big thing that we have left that we need to do in R2 is this kind of channel names, channel layouts API. This is really important. And error handling, uh, currently start, stop, just return bool. Probably that's not good. Like the other kind of portable I.O.-ish APIs like file system, they use std error code. So probably we should follow suit and also use std error code. I'd love to hear comments about that. Uh, open question is, do we, so you, you can use coroutines to generate samples. It's not clear to me yet how we can use coroutines to get input. But if there was a way to do this, maybe it would be cool to kind of have a coroutine-based API instead of this kind of old-school callback-based API, because then you can write these things that I showed a lot more elegantly. And then maybe you want to have this, I don't know yet, and then these, these are all the things that we're not going to do. So the mobile-specific stuff, uh, it's going to be somehow, like for example, if your microphone needs access, then whenever you try to open an input device, that's when a dialog would come up, for example. But all the stuff would be implementation defined. It wouldn't be a part of the official library API definition. And then file I.O. and algorithms, this is all stuff that can be portably done on top of this. So this is out of scope uh, because this is just the minimum portable layer that we need to make all of the stuff possible for other people to do. And then this is the last slide. Where should this go? This is an open question. We could target an audio TS, or we could target a TS that combines all of these things that are kind of in flight now, which is graphics and audio, and maybe we get some kind of user, mouse, keyboard, touch input library as well. It could go into one of the next international standards. <coughs> it could actually be, I think that's completely independent from standardization, it could become a boost audio library, and I think that would be really cool. I think, you know, if this is kind of a, I think this kind of API that would um, fit well into boost. So if anyone wants to help me with that and maybe review this library to get it in, then that would be really cool. It's not much code, it's just 500 lines of code. Um, I mean, it's gonna be more if you have Windows and Linux, but. Um, the API is not that big, so it would be great to have this uh, as a candidate for maybe putting this into Boost. And then maybe it sh we should just not do any of these things. It will be just another library on GitHub, and that's also fine. So let's talk about these things. I'll be around for the rest of the week. Thank you. <laughs>